Hello and welcome to Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack, for our first show of 2023. To kick the year off, I'm joined by Professor Meg Russell, Director of the Constitution Unit at UCL. Long-term listeners may remember she came on the show in 2021 to talk about how to make the House of Commons work better. This time, though, we're going to be taking a look at the House of Lords. So welcome to the show, Meg. Nice to be back and good to see you, Mark. Now, since House, the House of Lords reforms in 1910, which notoriously were meant to be an interim measure, the Lords has turned out to be remarkably resistant to further stages of reform. And it's a task, I think, that it's fair to say many Lib Dems underestimated in the 2010 coalition. We thought, ah, it's in the coalition agreement. It will now happen. And so I recently took a look back at the bill that failed in 2010 to 15. And I must admit, to my unexpert eye, Somewhat to my surprise, it didn't seem actually that complicated a bill, certainly compared with the legislation that was successfully passed at different times for, say, devolution in Scotland or in Wales or in London or in Northern Ireland. It seemed actually a pretty straightforward bill, yet the track record of Lord's reform is that it repeatedly fails to happen. So to kick our discussion off, Meg, what's your take on why it has so often proved over the last century and a bit so difficult to further reform the House of Lords. Well, it's more than a century and a bit. You can say it's been difficult to reform for 300 years or more, in fact, because, of course, the 1911 reform itself was considered very long overdue and Lords reform had been much under discussion in the 19th century. So there's a there's a long historical view, but there's also, I think I would start with an international view because it's very easy to think that we have a peculiar problem with the House of Lords. It's easy to think the House of Lords itself is peculiar, which it is to some extent, but it's not as peculiar as many people would assume. And also that somehow it's a kind of British problem, this failure to reform our second chamber. There are many second chambers around the world. 70... Four, I think, the most recent count. And although none of them are quite like the House of Lords, they are very interesting institutions which are not as again, many people might naturally assume all elected institutions like the US Senate. Mm. You know, many of them are not directly elected. There are actually only five parliamentary systems that have entirely directly elected second chambers. Presidential systems use them a bit more like the US. But in other places, it's very common for you to have indirectly elected members of the second chamber. So chosen by provincial parliaments or local government, that kind of thing, and to have appointed members. Um, And many of these institutions are controversial, partly for that reason, partly because they're not in they're not directly elected and they're subject to challenge, therefore, on the basis of their legitimacy, but also because of what they do. So they're there to be the kind of grit in the oyster. They're there to, you know, you have a policy that goes through the first chamber that in a parliamentary system will have the endorsement of the government. So the elected legitimate democratic people have endorsed a policy and it's the job of the second chamber to say hold on a tick are you sure that's the right policy if all they do is agree everything that's agreed by the lower house people are going to say what a waste of time the second chamber is but if they start to ask awkward questions then the government and the governing party gets quite aggravated and starts to think the second chamber is a problem because it's interfering too much so There's a pair of academics who wrote a book about 20 years ago who referred to, it was a comparative book about senates around the world. They referred to second chambers as essentially contested institutions Mm. because of the job that they do and because of their makeup, which is generally, you know, there's no point having them unless they're on a different basis of some kind Mm. to the first chamber. You know, it might be the electoral system. It doesn't necessarily mean they're not elected, but they would have a different. So in Australia, for example, you've got a majoritarian House of Representatives, but then the Senate's elected on a PR basis. So again, you've got tension built into the system between the two and these sort of contests for who has the right to make the decision on policy. And that's often very unpopular with governments. Consequently, there are debates about reform all over the world, but it very rarely happens because it's really it's inherent in the system of bicameralism that you have this kind of tension. And it's very hard, therefore, to say, oh, well, let's just move to a chamber which is like this. Mm. You know, let's increase the powers, reduce the powers, make it more 
democratically legitimate or less democratically legitimate, sort of almost any direction you try and move on the chessboard, you approach a different kind of set of problems. And consequently, that lots of countries are stuck in these reform discussions on an almost perpetual basis. But I would have to say, second chambers are a good thing. I think and that's really interesting, the idea that the nature and structure of a second chamber is almost inevitably going to be controversial, unless it's a complete waste of time, in which case it should also be controversial. It's also reason. controversial. Yeah, look but to I, Italy, I, I, where you have two chambers which are almost identical, and people talk about what's the point of having yeah. two chambers, yeah. But I do wonder if there is something different about the problems of reforming the Lords in the UK, in the, I mean, the Lords does seem to have two quite unusual, I say this with slight caution, because you might be about to reel off 38 countries that, may, <laughs> that that also have this, but it seems the Lords seem to have two quite unusual properties that have resisted repeated attempts at reform. One is it's just huge. It's an, you know, it's, it's very large. And the second is, I mean, we still have, albeit we have elections by STV for hereditary peers to have the vote in the Lords. It's a wonderfully weird and ironic you know combination of using using transferable voting to pick people from amongst the pool of hereditary peers but we still have the hereditary principle in part determining who gets to be in the lords it, so it does feel like there is something that is not just that in britain we've got the inevitable tension about the relative roles of the lords and the commons but there is something about where we've really still not moved on from the taking your point, the 18th century or earlier roots of the Lords that we've, in, in the way that the Second Chamber, I think in a lot of, if not pretty much all other countries, is at least a 20th century designed institution. We've still got one that's that's got its roots way back before then. I'm going to question your question, because where do you get the idea that hereditary peers are elected by STV? Well, so when... Now, are you wrong or am I wrong on this? Because they're normally I'm... they're normally elected one at a time. Sorry, you're right. It's by transferable voting. So by, by AD yes. rather than STV. Sorry, you're right. Yes. Yes. So the House of Lords does definitely retain elements mm -hmm. from its history. I mean, you know, one of the obvious ones is the bishops. I mean, the, both the bishops and the hereditary peers have sort of been there almost in eternity, really, since, you know, the very roots of our parliament. But at the same time, it has, I wouldn't underestimate the extent to which it has changed, particularly the 1958 reform was very transformatory. So the 1958 reform, that was the Life Peerages Act, mm. which allowed people with the slight complication that we had had law lords appointed on a life basis since the late 19th century. But that was essentially the beginning of the, the life peers in 1958. Because before that, the only way you could be appointed to the place was as a hereditary peer and you handed your title on to your children or your, you know, your descendants which is kind of an interesting bit of context about the Lords, actually, that until 1958, to be appointed, you had to be appointed as a hereditary peer. So one of the people who sits in there is the grandson of Clement Attlee, for example. Mm. So, you know, when we say that these people are all sort of people who had affairs with monarchs going back centuries, descendants of people who had affairs with monarchs going back centuries, or all of this kind of thing, it's not really true. A lot of the titles are fairly young, but... Um, the 1958 reform changed the place a lot. It brought women in for the first time. And ever since 1958, virtually everybody who's been appointed has been appointed as a life peer. Now, whether you think that's some sort of throwback to a pre-20th century system, or whether you think that's a modern innovation, I suppose is open to dispute. But the House of Lords that we have now is significantly built on reforms that happened in the 20th century, actually. The 1911 and 1949 Parliament Acts, which defined its powers. The 1958 Life Peerages Act, which brought life peers in for the first time. The 1999 Act, equally importantly, which saw most of the hereditary peers evicted. And then in 2014, we had a little act which allowed people to retire, so you don't even have to sit for life anymore. Add all that up, mm. and it's quite a lot of change. I admit it's not necessarily the chamber that you would sit down and design if you were designing something from scratch now, but to say that it's sort of set in aspic, I think, is quite wrong, actually. And I guess the other thing to extend that point a little bit is that the Lords itself has been moderately responsive to the idea of at least incremental reform. So things like the idea that peers can, is, has had widespread support in the Lords, whilst the plans for more significant reform have pretty much all fallen foul of 
backbench rebellions by MPs in the House of Commons, that it's actually backbenchers in the Commons who have turned out to be the biggest obstacles to Lords reform rather than the Lords itself, which, which is not what you would expect necessarily. You would normally think that the people who are most resistant to a body being reformed or abolished are members of the body itself. So why, do, why is it, does it so trigger backbench MP opposition, the idea of Lords reform, do you think? I think there's a constant fear among members of the House of Commons that if you change the Lords, it's going to challenge their status and their role. And also, you know, that sounds rather self-serving, but also I think there's a great deal of concern among members of the Commons that you're going to get into some sort of gridlock situation where decision making becomes too difficult. We've seen, I mean, you're quite right what you say about peas being the primary block. And you can see that all the way back, if not earlier, you can certainly see it all the way back to the 1960s when Harold Wilson attempted a reform, which got totally bogged down at its committee stage in the House of Commons. And the bill never got any further and, and never made it to the Lords. And certainly there were endless arguments, um, particularly under the Blair governments, to an extent under Gordon Brown, and then, of course, the rather catastrophic attempts by the coalition, which you've already referred to, where, again, a bill was introduced, but it never got beyond beyond, beyond its second reading. If and I, I can pick up on your word catastrophic there, <laughs> because I, I suspect a fair number of listeners will wince slightly at the use of the word catastrophic. But I have to say, I, I remember talking to one of your colleagues in must have been 2010, 2011, and they were absolutely right. And I was wrong about how difficult getting Lords reform through would be so possibly although I still wince slightly at your choice of the word catastrophic it's a very fair choice <laughs> choice of word well, perhaps. that's interesting but that it was one of my colleagues and not me I, w- I wonder who that was because I had a very similar conversation back at that time just after the 2010 election I actually spoke to Nick Clegg who mm. had the personal responsibility for this policy as deputy prime minister and I tried to warn him how difficult it would be and he just didn't accept I mean he he thought that he kept saying to me repeatedly it's in the coalition agreement conservative MPs have to vote for it. And I was saying, well, look, I'm I'm not convinced that they will. Because if you look back to Blair's time, you know, the Blair government's had an enormous majority. There were repeated attempts to get agreement on Lord's reform, but the parliamentary party was completely split. And there were people who were very much opposed to the introduction of elections for the House of Lords, because, as I've said, they worry about their own status. They worry about there being for example, competition on the ground over constituency work, having other people on their patch, perhaps from other parties who are you know, going to be, there's going to be local friction. But I think in a much more sort of principled way, they genuinely also worry that if you can have an opposition controlled second chamber, which has an electoral mandate, then it may make it very impos- very difficult for governments to act. So there are all sorts of factors which put MPs off and as i say you know drawing on the intellect on the international experience it's very difficult to it's very difficult to design a complementary chamber because we all think that i mean obviously there are arguments about there are arguments about electoral systems but we basically all think that the way we do the house of commons is kind of what you need to do to have a first chamber you everybody should have a vote etc of course you know those are those are totally uncontroversial views but when it comes to the second chamber it's not actually quite so obvious because you don't want to make the first chamber unable to operate and people people worry about that you're also quite right to say that there have been lots of initiatives coming from the lords so the 2014 bill that i referred to was actually a a private members bill in the lords to introduce retirement i know that people in the lords were very keen on the 1958 act or people defenders of the lords are very keen on the 1958 act in order to kind of reinvigorate the place because it was rather dying on its feet and now, for example, we've had for years and years now the former Labour chief whip, Lord Grocott, Bruce Grocott, trying to get a bill through to end the hereditary peer by-election so that the hereditary peers would sort of gradually die out one by one until there were none left. And that that gets blocked. That, To be fair, that is getting blocked in the Lords, but it's because it's a private member's bill and because procedurally in the Lords, it, it takes no more than a handful mm of opponents to block a bill to make sure that it doesn't happen if the if the 
if the government picked that up, if there was actually a vote in the Lords, probably 90% of peers would be in favour of that reform because they know that it does the reputation of the place no good. And, and uh, you mentioned size as well. And there's people, yeah. there's many people in the House of Lords who are very, very keen to see something done about the size of the place. It is as big as it is because of uncontrolled prime ministerial patronage. Mm. Uh, there are some concerns about the quality of people who are being put in, at least from time to time, if not quite frequently, as well as the quantity of people who are being put in. And members of the House of Lords know that this harms their institution and its ability to do its job if it has a reputation for being too big and having inappropriate people in it they would love to see something done about that and it's actually the government that isn't acting and the prime minister this is i don't want to sound like too much of a def defender of the house of lords the most to my mind disgraceful thing about the entire system is that the prime minister can put in however many people he or she likes with whatever party balance he or she likes. And I think that some prime ministers have actually worked out that if they put in an excessive number of people and they put people in who are of questionable quality, that will strengthen the executive against parliament because it brings the House of Lords into disrepute. Yeah. Now, that's not actually a criticism of the Lords as such, because the Lords want to get rid of that system. It's a criticism well, of prime ministers and the way they abuse their patronage mm -hmm. powers. And I think something needs to be done about that. Yeah. I, I wonder, though, if those patronage powers also are important in terms of understanding the failures of previous Lords reformed in terms of their impact on leaders of the opposition. Because I think if you're a leader of the opposition, even though the number of peers and when you get to appoint them is in the hands of the prime minister, and as you said, pretty much a solo power the prime minister has, it is nonetheless a really important piece of patronage that the leader of the opposition has, that they can appoint a select few to a place in parliament for life. And whilst I've known, whilst generally I'm willing to defend politicians as being more principled and less less dodgy and self-interested than public perception might might have, it does strike me that number of times a leader of the opposition has not when push comes to shove, been that keen really on seeing a Lord's reform, whether just somewhere in the dark recesses of their soul, that little bit of self-interest is having more of an influence on them than perhaps it should do. Or am I being too cynical, do you think? It's an interesting take. I think, I'm not sure if you're being too cynical, but I think you're pointing your cynicism at the wrong person, probably. Nah. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think that that power for leaders of the opposition is particularly worth getting excited about i mean we do the, the one of the one of the most obvious comparators for the house of lords is the canadian senate which is also entirely appointed and in canada they did not have the convention that we have established in the uk that the prime minister appointed from outside his or her own party which was really a problem and in fact they've dealt with that now because trudeau essentially essentially has given up his patronage power and given it all to an independent commission which puts in only independent non-party people which is a very interesting experiment in Canada but up until that point it was entirely government people who got put in it's very good that we had a more kind of plural system where people from the opposition would also be appointed but they tend to be greatly underappointed in comparison to the governing side which is one of the reasons why the size of the chamber gets constantly pushed upwards because the prime minister will appoint will will over appoint from his or her own party which means that their party overtakes more and more the opposition so that when the opposition takes over as the government the opposition feels the need to overappoint from their side in order to counterbalance and what that means is you've got this sort of ever upward trajectory where they're kind of competing with each other to 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 equalize the seats so I doubt, I doubt this preys on the mind very much of the leader of the opposition in terms of the excitement of getting opposition peers. Perhaps they're thinking a little bit about when they get into government, how useful it would be to have that patronage power for themselves to appoint to the government benches. So, yeah, I mean, I think in the UK that is a factor to an extent, but I wouldn't over exaggerate it because, as I say, there are obstacles to reform everywhere. And given all of those obstacles, I guess the question is for those people, including myself, who hope for further Lords reform in future, whether the incremental or the Big Bang approach is best. And in a way, one could try to pursue both tracks. But I think certainly in the past, they've some they've often been seen to be 
rival routes that one has to pick between, partly because you might decide, well, say, if you're negotiating a coalition agreement, what's the thing that you go for in the coalition agreement? And partly, I think, because people who favour Big Bang reform have often feared that incremental reform that deals with one or two of the worst elements of the existing system then actually make it harder to achieve Big Bang reform because you're just, you know, you're modifying just enough to, in that sense, keep the pressures of, of, of bigger reform at bay, perhaps. That said, clearly, if one looks over the last century, it's been incremental reform that has made some progress and Big Bang reform that has always failed. So what, what would your advice in that sense be to people hoping for further Lord's reform as to which route is best to, to pick or indeed maybe to avoid picking between them and try to pursue both? Yeah, yeah. this is an enormous frustration to me that the two are seen to be in opposition to each other. I don't think that's right. I think what you say is quite right that you can pursue the two at once, potentially. I think, you know, the Labour government of 1997, which which went for a two-stage reform, I think that was very wise because at least the little thing, which ter- which, which was a pretty big thing, actually, you know, ev- evicting around about 700 hereditary peers, that was a pretty big thing, but it was a very small, simple measure in legislative terms. At least that happened. The rest didn't happen. The history suggests that the incremental things happen and the big bang things don't happen because there are so many obstacles in their way. But I, my frustration is with the people who think that small reform is the enemy of big reform. Mm. I think that's a very dangerous position to take, actually, because, as you say, small reform does happen and the danger is that big reform never happens. And actually, for all the time that small reform isn't happening, Parliament is being discredited and weakened. Mm. If you were to, if you looked back, I mean, really, all of the reforms that we've talked about, 1911, 1949, 1958, 1999, were all thing, things that had been under discussion for, I think it's probably fair to say, decades Certainly, the introduction of life peers had been under under discussion for at least half a century before it was brought in in 1958. And the removal of the hereditary peers had been under discussion for half a century before 1999. If we look back, can we honestly say that we would have got big reform if 1958 hadn't happened and if 1999 hadn't happened? Can we honestly say that we can we be optimistic that we'd be in a better place with the House of Lords? If those small incremental reforms hadn't happened, I think we might have headed for perhaps abolition. You know, at both points, Mm. pre-58 and pre-99, the House of Lords was in a kind of perilous state where it had very little real political power to question what was going on, to change policy, because it, it was so discredited for the basis of its membership. And I think we're creeping towards that kind of situation again, with the size of the chamber being up over 820, with these questions, some of these questions about the quality of people who are being Mm. put in. And I think the imperative is to deal with those questions come what may. Maybe big reform is possible as well. But if you say we're not going to do big, we're not going to do small reform because we think somehow magically big reform is going to fall from the sky if we leave small reform, that's a really dangerous position to take because you are weakening parliament bit by bit the longer you leave the 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 essential things not dealt with i i don't think it's that obvious that that take on history is necessarily right because i think had more widespread uh hereditary membership of the lords been preserved you know if that incremental bit of reform hadn't happened i think that would be significantly damaging to the reputation of the Lords and would provide a really good hook for arguing this is why reform is needed because there is this really absurd awful feature to the Lords and you're right maybe that would parlay into a stronger stronger move to abolition but also the fear of abolition might also encourage more people to actually support meaningful reform so I I don't think it's obvious that incremental reform for how long do we think it's right to tolerate what I think you just referred to as an absurd, awful bit of mm. our constitution? You know, should we really tolerate mm. it for 20, 30, 40 years in the hope that something better will come along in the end? Because that's doing real damage. 
Yeah, well, I, I, this is the dilemma in it, in that sense, isn't it? In the when the potential. I mean, it's 20, 20 years, yeah. 23 years soon since the hereditary peer by elections have been going yeah. on. You know, is it really a bad idea to get rid of them? Should we wait until people are so angry that they're going to tear the entire thing up and replace it with an elected chamber? I think that could be quite a long time. But Big Bang reform obviously has turned out to be a remarkably slow moving approach. Yeah. (laughs) Granted. But but isn't part of the reason why it's not gone away as an idea is that every time you think about it, it's well, it's just, you know, you can do it with one act that we could come into force as quickly as you, you know. So if if we're thinking about the politics of the next two or three years, it's possible to hope, and one doesn't have, you know, you might think this hope is misplaced, but it's not completely eccentric to think, well, if Labour is properly committed to Lord's reform, and if Labour does well at the next election, whether it has a majority or maybe, or there's a hung parliament, you could imagine a new government in two years' time introducing big bang lords reform it takes a year to get through parliament maybe because it's a you know fairly contentious piece of legislation but in three years time you've got a fully reformed lords i I think in that sense it's quite different from say issues like britain's membership you know future relationship with the european union where definitely i you know i think most people who want britain to be back in the eu at some point would also agree that the at some point is going to be quite a few years away and therefore the argument for incremental steps of warmer relations with the EU in the interim is really powerful. With the Lords though, Big Bang reform always feels like well it could just be around the corner. Now I think you would rightly respond that it's always turned out not to be around the corner so maybe a different approach is is valid but isn't that the dilemma? Some people may have felt it's been around the corner for at least 150 years. Yeah, and yeah. it hasn't been. And I, mean, I, 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 I watched an event a few weeks ago, which was interesting at the Institute for Government. And I should have looked up the name of the guy. You, you'll probably be able to remind me who he was. He was a, he was a special advisor to Nick Clegg, I think, who was on the platform. He was talking very much about the coalition years and what had gone wrong. And I think this is a danger for Liberal Democrats to only look back to the coalition years, actually, mm. because clearly what happened, I, mean, I, I, I think I referred to it as catastrophic mm. before. I mean, I just mean it was a it was a very dramatic failure of a policy that so um yeah, Nick Clegg's bill, which had started as a white paper, there was a joint committee which looked at it. It was then introduced as a bill to have an 80% elected, 20% appointed replacement for the House of Lords. It got its second reading, but on the second reading, nine, 90 Conservative mm. MPs, backbenchers voted against, I think, I think it was 91. Labour supported the second reading. But then Labour wanted more time for the programme motion, so more time for the bill to be debated in detail and it was quite clear that the conservative rebels were going to vote with labor on the program motion so it would have been voted down so the whole thing just got dropped and poor Clegg had to do this press conference where he later had to admit that that it was dead they were never going to they were never going to bring it back the the liberal democrat advisor who spoke at the institute for government clearly looked back to this as a coalition problem Mm. that you know you could see very clearly there where the divide was Mm. between the I mean, I'm sure it was more complicated than that because it always is, you know, in, in all parties, there are people of different persuasions. But basically, you could boil it down to the Lib Dems wanted it and the cons- many of the Conservatives didn't and therefore it didn't happen. But you saw exactly the same pattern under Labour when Blair mm-hmm. had his huge majority. You know, the government side was split, mm-hmm. even though it was a single party government. And that's what happened under Wilson as well. So you're a serious optimist if you just, you know, if you put all your eggs in the basket of Labour is going to behave so differently now to what it did before, yeah. because I, I'm, undoubtedly there are people in the Labour Party who want big reform and people will be pressing for it. It may be in the manifesto. Mm. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think we've said that there are things that MPs habitually don't like about the introduction of a, a radically different House of Lords. You know, people are afraid of unintended consequences. And also going back to the role of the leader of the opposition in this, I think it's always, even if there's a leader of the opposition who on paper, you know, nominally is in favour of Lords reform, if there is something of a rebellion in the government's ranks, it's really tempting to back the rebels. You know, the that that opportunity of 
inflicting at least significant embarrassment on the government is a very strong temptation. And I think we saw a bit of this in the coalition period that had Labour said, you know what, this is the number of days we want allocated to this bill. You know, if, if Labour had been willing to commit to a specific number, I think there's a decent chance that, you know, Nick Clegg and colleagues would have been able to say, OK, let's have let's have a vote on that number. And a combination of Conservative ministers, Lib Dem MPs and Labour MPs, you know, potentially could have set that number. But the temptation to give the coalition a kicking was, you know, was too big. And, you know, it's it's applied similarly, I think, to Conservative leaders of the opposition on other issues in the past. If there's a really high profile issue, it's asking an awful lot of a leader of the opposition to not go for the let's just kick the government option. It's got to be something that feels really an important point of principle in a way that law to reform feels, you know, doesn't quite, doesn't quite bring out the... You are totally, you are totally right about that dynamic. And let me give you two examples, one of which enables me to plug my forthcoming book on them, on Brexit, <laughs> which uh, doesn't really fit in this podcast. But so the, the parliamentary battle for Brexit, which will be published mm. by Oxford University Press on the 23rd of March 2023, tells the story of what happened in Parliament in the run up to the referendum and mostly what happened mm. after the referendum. And obviously, I think I hope that might be of interest to your listeners. Mm -hmm. And maybe maybe I'm... I'll come back and talk to you about it but and, there's a and story I'll include a link in the show notes to the pre-orders <laughs> for that so watch out in the show notes if you're listening there's a sto there's a story on the referendum bill in 2015 in that book where i don't know whether you will remember that the government tried to change the perda the usual perda provisions oh, yeah. for a referendum mm. so that effectively the government could make sort of pro european the pro european case right up to the referendum yes. and there was a conservative eurosceptic backbench amendment. Um, I'm tempted to say it was led by Bernard Jenkin. Bernard Jenkin was closely involved as the chair of the Public Administration Constitutional Affairs Committee. Basically, the, the hardline Eurosceptics wanted the PERDA provisions to apply so that government would have to be silent in the run up to the referendum. And the government was arguing that Europe was so, so important that they couldn't keep quiet on European matters. The rebels put down an amendment and the opposition backed their amendment. And actually, that could have been quite a critical thing in terms of, it may or may not have been critical in, in the outcome of that very close referendum. But that, that was a real sign of the opposition. You could say it was a principal position because the PERDA provisions are there for a good reason to ensure that referendums are fair. But I think what they did was they balanced up on the one hand, the principle, and on the un, on, on, but on the other hand, also the benefit of giving the government a bloody a bloody nose. And they chose to give the government a bloody nose. And, and if you're a party that split on an issue, as Labour was on Brexit, you can most easily unite around, well, regardless, let's just oppose the government. That's totally. So you take me to my second example, mm. which is again the Clegg bill, mm. where the remarkable thing about that reform mm. was that Labour had gone through, Labour had been discussing all the way from 97 through to 2010 what to do about the House of Lords. There were five white papers, I think, under Labour. There were various sets of proposals. There was, a, again, a fairly catastrophic set of votes uh, back in 2003, where a whole range of options was put to the House of Commons, and famously, every single one of them was rejected. From it's, fully almost elected like to fully appointed. The, it's almost like putting lots of options to the Commons for a series of votes isn't a good mechanism. They should, <laughs> but should they, have remembered they, that they, during Brexit. They, they edged gradually from a position where they thought the replacement for the Lords should be largely appointed to one where they thought it should be largely elected. And in 2008, when Brown was leader, there was a white paper which said it should be 80% elected, 20% appointed, it should be large regional constituencies elected on PR, etc, etc, etc. That's what went in the Clegg bill. Mm. It was almost identical. Mm. And yet the Labour front bench was able to stand up and say there's all sorts of things. Yes, we're in favour of the principle, but there's all sorts of things in the detail that we don't like. But the detail was the same detail that had been in the Labour government's white paper. So given the opportunity, people are much more comfortable with sort of backpedalling on Lords reform and not making progress. It's mm. very, very difficult to get a coalition, a majority together on it in the House of Commons. And the danger is that that is where we remain. Now, if you're an optimist, you'd like to think that the next time will be different. Mm. But I would say, get yourself an insurance policy mm. and make sure that at least the little 
necessary things happen and you don't end up with nothing. So what would be your what would be the potential shopping list? Not necessarily your shopping personal shopping list, but the potential shopping list you might recommend to others based on your expertise of incremental reforms. There is obviously the abolition of the by-elections for the hereditary peers or indeed a, a step beyond that then of actually removing the hereditary peers completely what would be the other yeah. sort of incremental reforms you would suggest should be on on people's lists to think about well there's a fairly well established list which again you know is in line with what mm. in the past has happened that it is things that have been under discussion for a long time mm. that finally get the impetus yeah. maybe through a new government or some sort of change of circumstances that enables them to go through so yes the hereditary peers is is one of the obvious ones but cleaning up the appointments process i mean it really is you know the, the gordon brown proposals which came out recently described the house of lords as indefensible that's a very strong term, but I would use it with respect to some aspects of the House of Lords. And I think the degree of the Prime Minister's patronage powers is indefensible mm. in the 21st century that you have a Prime Minister who can choose how many go in, what the balance is between them, and who can even potentially wreck the reputation of the place by deliberately appointing an inappropriate number of people, etc. That has to end. So there have been various, and it's connected to the size of the place. Mm. So there have been various sets of proposals for reining in that patronage. We need a maximum limit on the size of the House of Lords. It's been much under discussion in recent years in the Lords just to simply set a cap that says it can't be bigger than the House of Commons. So it can't be more than 650. You could be more up, you could be more ambitious than that. You could say 600 or 550 or, six, or, or 500. But at the absolute limit, it shouldn't be bigger than the House of Commons. That's 170 members fewer than it's got. So you can either work towards that gradually by doing what? So there was a the Lord Speaker's Committee on the Size of the House, which reported in 2017, suggested that you have a policy of two out, one in. So mm. basically, you can't make an appointment to the Lords until two people have left. And if you do that gradually, eventually the size works its way down. That's quite a slow process. But that's the absolute minimum, I think. Or more ambitiously, you could do something that, like what was done in 1999, where you say, right, we're going to go down overnight to 650 and we're going to have elections inside each of the party groups to reduce the, to reduce the size of the chamber down. That's a bit trickier. It would definitely need legislation, but that would enable the party groups to get rid of some of the people that they think are the least defensible members, which might not be a bad thing and would strengthen the place. But the House of Lords Appointments Commission needs to be given more power. So it should be overseeing the system of how many appointments are allowed. And there should also be a fair formula for sharing out seats between the parties to get away from this problem whereby the Prime Minister can overappoint from their own party. So there needs to be a fair sharing system. And I think that the House of Lords Appointments Commission, and that there's a lot of support for this, should also have more control of the quality of people who are going in. So when you appoint a new crossbencher, those people are interviewed, they have to fill in a form, application form, references are taken up, they're interviewed, they're asked about their contribution to the place, whereas party peers are just put in on the recommendation of their party leaders. And there doesn't even have to be any sort of justification given for why they're the right type of people. So there should be a more transparent process for, you know, party leaders should probably be publishing lists of people with indications of what their qualifications are and why they're being put forward and the, the, the appointments commission should endorse that and should be able to push back if the types of people being put forward are not right. And how well do you think the House of Lords Appointments Commission would weather such the increased scrutiny and controversy that would come with such increased power? Because the thing that strikes me about it at the moment is I think even if you follow, most people who follow politics quite closely will know pretty much nothing about who is on the commission, why they're there, what their powers are, other than they occasionally pop up as being the good people in a story about the prime minister wanting to appoint somebody outrageous. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, I think at the moment, the commission and its structure and how it's composed gets a relatively easy ride because they're, they're just the good guys that every now and again pop up in a story. But the more power they have, the more there's going to be controversial things that they are doing or not doing. And it is, I, I can see how it could end up being viewed as a very unaccountable 
sort of almost self-selecting clique. So do you think it would work as it's currently structured or would you point towards possible reforms in how it's either comprised or held accountable for its work? I don't have major concerns about it the way that it is now. I think it's a fair point that you make that it would come under greater scrutiny if it had more power, because, yeah, they're not only the good guys, they're the powerless guys at the moment. Um, yeah, being virtuous and powerless is the perfect combination <laughs> for, being, for being liked. But I think there's an important dynamic that we need to remember, I think, which applies in all, in, in all sorts of walks of life, and it, it applies very much in Parliament, that having better scrutiny does not necessarily lead to more conflict. It can just lead to better policy making. So I think the first thing that would happen if the House of Lords Appointments Commission had more power and there were clearer criteria for what is wanted from members of the House of Lords in two senses, both personally at the individual level and also collectively in terms of things like gender balance, ethnic balance, balance from people from different parts of the country and certainly party balance, if those kind of criteria were written down and it was the job of the House of Lords Appointments Commission to check that they were being met, the parties would meet them. Mm. You know, I, d I don't think you'd see conflict very much, if at all, between because I don't think it's I don't think certainly don't think it should be the job of the Appointments Commission to kind of nitpick about which individual former members of the House of Commons a party should be able to appoint or something unless say they've put 10 people forward and they're all men mm. so you know if it's clear what the expectations are and what the, the what the kind of boundaries are I think the parties would meet the expectations and it would be a relatively harmonious process actually I doubt that there would be much controversy spilling over and I suspect a decent number of Lib Dem listeners to this will have chuckled at your reference to improved scrutiny doesn't have to equal more conflict because in fact internally we've recently changed how the federal board our sort of national executive of the political party how is scrutinized and i think definitely that's everyone's hope that it leads to better decision making rather than increased internal conflict it's a good point that more scrutiny can be more, a, more, a more sunlight on the decisions yeah. greater transparency Absolutely. can in itself achieve a great deal so i think we need more transparency but i also think we need a better a tighter framework of rules as to what's allowed yeah. so put a cap on the numbers have a formula for how many each party can get and have some requirements in terms of diversity among the types of people yeah. who are put forward and then the appointments commission just sort of says yep the party's put forward these i think that's fair yeah. they've put forward rather they've put forward a rather disproportionate number of men this time but let's remember that the last time they put forward a disproportionate number of women so maybe that's fine yeah. you know just a little bit of light touch regulation i think is all it would take if you had a clear framework for appointments yeah that's really interesting. I think from all of what you said, there's obviously quite a few potential pointers for the Lib Dems there. I, I, I do hanker after Big Bang reform rather more than you do, clearly, but you've definitely made some really excellent points about the risks of hankering after Big Bang reform and also the way it can be seen as as a uh, complementary to rather than a rival to incremental reform. In terms of the hankering, I think you're probably right, but it's it's probably it's probably just worth reminding your listeners for context that my first book on reform in the House of Lords, which was based on the way that other places work overseas, was published nearly 23 years ago now, and it came down in favour of a majority elected House probably minority appointed, yeah. something rather similar to what the Jack Straw proposals and then the Clegg proposals yeah. wound up being. And I worked for Robin Cook when he was leader of the House of Commons, and he was trying to push through a big ambitious reform, yeah. which, which was largely elected. Mm. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not that I come from a position of hostility to that reform. I've just studied reform in the UK and around the world far too much to be optimistic about its likelihood of happening. And I think that it's a tragedy if Nick Clegg used to have a phrase, you know, in relation to Lord's reform, he used to say, you mustn't let the best be the enemy of the good. Mm. He said that repeatedly. If you Google it, you'll find him saying it on Lord's reform many times. But in a way, that is what happened under the coalition. You know, you shoot for the moon and get nothing. So so grasp what you can get when you can get it would be my, re my recommendation. 
Excellent. That sounds like a fantastic note on which to wrap up this conversation. So thank you so much for your time, Meg. And I will include in the show notes a link to, for people to be able to pre-order uh, that book that you've got coming out about the parliamentary battle for Brexit. And people can find Meg's work on Twitter via the Constitution Unit's Twitter feed, which is at conunit underscore UCL. And you can find myself on Twitter at Mark Pack and this podcast at Bar Chart Podcast. So thank you very much to everyone for listening. And if you enjoyed listening to this show, please do tell others about this podcast and give it a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you.